Hello, this is a session about Internet and Web Fundamentals. It's for you if you want to know more about how the Internet works, how the Web works, what are the main protocols of the Internet and the main protocols of the Web and the document formats of the Web. Also, you will learn a little bit about the domain name system. So, let's get started. The Internet. It's a worldwide network of, of computers. It's connected by a lesser known protocol known as the Internet Protocol or IP for short. It has many sub protocols such as TCP, UDP, ICMP. And these protocols um, of them TCP IP or TCP slash IP or TCP over IP um, is probably the most common one. It allows for reliable packet delivery, which means that packets are guaranteed to reach from the source to the destination. And if they don't reach, it is considered a major error. Okay. And as opposed to UDP IP, where packets are delivered on best effort basis, so it's possible that some of the packets don't make it in time. And that's considered okay because UDP IP trades reliability for faster delivery. So that makes it ideal for real-time communication such as audio streaming, video streaming, um, and video audio communication, two-way communication. So let's get to the next slide, which is the IP address. Let's talk about IP addresses. IP addresses are they are a 32-bit number assigned by the internet protocol to each node on the network. It's written as a pair of, uh, as a tuple of four numbers. Each of them is a decimal number. So for example, it will be 192.168.1.1 being an example. Each number is between 0 to 255 and the the IP address is a unique number. It uniquely identifies a node on the network. And if it is the public internet, then it means it uniquely identifies that node, that IP, that computer on the internet um, across the world. So that is uh, the 32-bit number is for IPv4, the original version of Internet Protocol. But then there is a new version of Internet Protocol called IPv6, which uses 128-bit IP addresses, which expands the address space quite a bit. And uh, so that should be fun. Let's talk about TCP IP. TCP IP is a reliable communication protocol. What does that mean? That means when you send packets from the one end to the other end, the other end receives it in the same order that they were sent, and it receives it, uh, you know, all of them. And if it doesn't receive them, it stops the the stream and uh, causes an error or waits for the packet to be retransmitted. So, and then the TCP IP uses source port numbers as well as destination port numbers in addition to the IP address. Sources have IP address, the sender and the receiver has IP address, but in addition they also have port numbers. These port numbers range from 1 to 64K. When I say 64K, I hope you understand 1K is 1024, so 64 times 1024. And then port numbers from 1 to 1024 are considered special ports. They are privileged ports because these ports are known, are used by well-known protocols. And so these are the default ports assigned to well-known protocols. And we'll see what well-known protocols very quickly. So what well-known protocols are there? There is SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol for sending emails. POP or IMAP, that is for retrieving your emails from a mailbox on the internet or on some server. FTP, which is this file transfer protocol. It's used for sending and receiving files to and from a server. And then SSH, 
secure shell protocol and that is for remoting into servers but then it's more than that it's just not remote shell into a server it's, it's also used for file transfers and a lot more so let's talk about dns names dns names are human readable names given to ip addresses as you know ip addresses are hard to remember you know it's very hard to remember a series of four uh, numbers ranging from 1 to 255. It's even harder to remember with IPv6 coming along, which is 128-bit numbers. So you need a human readable name or something that we can spell and therefore remember. And so that's why we have websites like google.com and so on and so forth. But underlying IP addresses are probably very few people actually remember them. So mo most websites are known by their uh, host names and domain names instead of their IP addresses. So the format is hostname dot domain name dot TLD. What is TLD? It's top level domain. So TLD examples are dot com, dot org, dot net, dot edu dot gov etc and some examples of domains are spinspire.com unf.edu etc and then the full host name <clears throat> the examples are www.spinspire.com or server1.spinspire.com or www.google.com and so on and so forth let's talk about the web. So the web is distinct from the internet. It is built on top of the internet. It is not same as the internet. Although a lot of people say internet when they really mean the web. Its primary communication protocol is HTTP, which is the hypertext transfer protocol. Remember, this is distinct from TCP IP or IP, which is the protocol of the internet. Internet is a lower level, uh, not as user friendly as the web is. Web is higher level. It uses higher level protocols such as HTTP and um, Internet is the underlying. It, it makes everything work, of course. In, there can be no web without the Internet. So the primary document format of the web is HTML, Hypertext Markup Language. It uses CSS or cascading style sheets for visual styling of the HTML and it uses JavaScript for client side or in browser programming. What does that mean? CSS for styling, visual styling to make your pages look pretty or look appealing. JavaScript for running programs within the browser but of course only within the browser in such a way that they don't interfere with either the server or your own personal computer so that's why javascript programs in the browser they are set to be running in a sandbox as in a some kind of a of a container a jail and then finally there are assets also on the web such as the media uh, images audio files, video files, and so on and so forth, which are embedded into a web page. HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. What is it? It is the protocol of the web. It's a text-based protocol, which means it's clear text. You can read it. You can, you can look at it and, and understand what they are doing in there which, by the way, you can and should do using um, either Firefox development tools or um, Chrome developer tools. We will see that in a second. It's built on top of TCP IP. Remember I said web is built on top of the internet? Now internet uses IP, that's the primary protocol. TCP IP is the reliable protocol built on top of IP, which means it makes sure all the packets get there. You get the all of the data or none of the data. Now, HTTP hypertext protocol is 
the protocol of the web and didn't I say that web is built on top of the internet so HTTP is built on top of TCP IP it's a client server protocol there is a client involved and then there is a server involved um, a server is a machine out on the internet that is always ready to wait for your requests accept them and serve you a response and the client is of course your computer uh, it is a request response protocol where uh, it's not a, a messaging protocol as in everybody keeps sending messages randomly to each other it's a request response protocol first message that goes out of your client to the server is the request and the server responds with a response and both this activity is synchronous meaning to say you send the request you wait for the response and then you get the response you interpret the response parse it and display it to the user so some examples of the servers are when I say servers I mean server software are Apache uh, the most common web server on the internet Nginx which is also a very good server it's uh, getting more popular nowadays IIS which is Microsoft Windows uh, web server and Tomcat which is Java uh, web server of course there are much many more examples on that but uh, these should suffice should give you some idea of what kind of server software is out there then when it comes to clients uh, the clients are the browsers basically your computer uses the internet through a browser and examples of browsers are Chrome Internet Explorer IE that is Firefox so and Safari uh, in case you are a Mac user but uh, but the fourth one in here is curl that's a, an unusual a different type of web browser it's a text mode web browser it is not meant uh, for end users it is meant more for programming and scripting but it's a very important tool for any developer so HTTP the protocol uses headers headers are metadata about the request or the response and um, example of that would be content type so content type header describes that the request that I'm sending to the server is text HTML or whatever type of request is more commonly this kind of uh, content type text slash HTML is used in responses the response from the server is of content type text HTML and that information comes back from the server to the browser as a header there are request methods involved get and post are most common ones but there are other types as well these request methods define the semantics of the request what does that mean it means what what type of operation do I want the server to perform uh, do am I trying to retrieve information only or am I trying to send information to the server within the server or the host the requests have to point to a path the path usually starts with a slash which is the base or the dock root of the web server and then you can say slash foo slash bar which means I am looking for a path foo within and that, that I'm looking for sub path bar so these paths they indicate the endpoint or the program within the server that is supposed to process your request and requests have status codes uh, the responses sorry have status codes examples are 200 which is success 404 which means not found the resource is not found 500 means server error and so on and so forth so these response codes they indicate success failure or some other neutral uh, neutral status some requests can have body uh, such as posts they have body and some don't like gets don't have a body and most responses do have a body although it is possible to have responses that do not have a body in which case the response consists sure and uh, purely of just uh, headers and but all, all the requests they have method request method and uh, they have path they have headers 
and they have response status. So let's take a look at um, a live browser and then we should be able to see an example of what we have been talking about. So let's uh, fire up the Chrome browser and uh, we go into the incognito mode because I don't want to be tracked while I'm on the internet. So let's type a website name in the browser address bar www.spinspire.com I typed and it brought up the website and when it did um, here's the website but but you must remember that it actually issued a whole bunch of requests let's see what's going on behind the scenes in order to see what's going on behind the scenes just right click within your Chrome browser and click the inspect a control shift I option. So this is the inspect. This, this takes you to the Chrome developer uh, tools. And in here, there are many, many places to look at, but I am interested in what's going on at the network level. So I go into the network browser. Now in order to, <coughs> to see what's going on behind the scenes, one more time, I have to reload this page. So I right click on this. I can just click the reload button here. So I can right click and say hard reload, which is what I want to do just to show you what's going on. So there you go. Oh, as you might expect that there was an HTTP request issued, but you probably did not expect this many, 93 HTTP requests. So that's because it is loading the assets the CSS files and the images and whatnot. Let's take a look at the first one. Here it is. This is the request. It says a request to the URL HTTPS spinspire.com. Um, HTTPS is simply the secure version of HTTP. And we can talk about that in another, uh, another session. But for now, let's just uh, think of it uh, same as HTTP. The request method. Remember, I was telling you that there is a request method, uh, which is get. The status code is 200. Remember, that is not a part of the request. It's a part of the re response. And the remote address, this is the IP address that we hit. And here you can see, uh, we did not type the IP address. We typed only the domain name. Or we could have typed www.spinspire.com, which would be the host name. In this case, the domain name itself serves as the host name. So, that's the DNS name, but behind the scenes, it translated the DNS name into an IP address. Now let's look, before we look at the response headers, let's look at the request headers and the request body. Well, it so happens that this is a get request, so it has no request body. These are some of the headers, uh, some examples of the headers. And you can, since we were not sending any information, there is no content type sent. To the server but when the ser and here are the response headers the server is sending back a content type of text html but in addition it sends some other information as in character set utf8 the server says that this page expires at so and so time this page was generated at this time the server time stamp is this and it will expire at this time um, it looks like it will expire in six months, apparently. Um, the server that is serving it is Nginx 1.8.1 and so on and so forth. So the thing to remember is we issued a GET request. We received a 200 status code response. We sent a bunch of request headers and we received a bunch of response headers. And finally, the actual response body is in here and that's the response body, this response body is formatted as HTML. It's in the HTML hypertext markup language. Okay. And that was already in hinted by the response header of content type, which said, I'm sending you text slash HTML. Okay. So we looked at the Chrome developer tools and we saw how 
how the uh, get request looks like. So get is the most common HTTP request. It is used for retrieval of information, read-only, which is what you do most of the time on the web. Um, it's issued when you follow a link or you type an address into the address bar, which is what we just did, or you click a bookmark. So all of them issue a GET request. It does not have a request party, which is what we saw. Uh, there is no request party there. It is cacheable, repeatable, and cannot change the server state. This is important. GET requests are uh, supposed to be read-only. They do not affect the state of the server. That's why uh, if the server is, returns a response and the server says this is good for a day or a week or a month, it, it can be cached either by in between servers, proxy servers, or by your browser. So that's why it's cacheable, repeatable, as in you can repeat that request any number of times and you should roughly get the same response. Uh, of course, things can change, right? Um, the news changes and the weather changes, but it's repeatable within a short period until it expires. And then it cannot change the server state, which means you cannot affect the state of the server. You are not supposed to at least. And the server is supposed to protect itself when you are issuing a GET request. In other words, GET requests are idempotent. It's a big word, idempotent. Uh, please look it up on Wikipedia or somewhere else. Uh, So, an example of a GET request would be when you want to get or retrieve the account balance in a bank account. Another request type which is common but less common than GET is POST. Um, it's used for sending information from your browser to the server, which means the server is going to receive that information and write it somewhere, hopefully. It's going to affect some kind of change, right? And that's why it's a read-write request. It is uh, issued when you submit an HTML form, for example, and uh, it's not cacheable. It is not repeatable, and it can change the st state of the server. Which means when you send a POST request, uh, the server is supposed to receive it, there is, and the response is supposed to come directly from the server and not from an in-between party, like a proxy server or a caching server or your own browser just generating the response out of its cache. Um, that's because it is going to change the state of the server and now the server may have something new to say. So an example would be when you post a bank transaction. So that's kind of obvious because uh, when you post a trans bank transaction you are changing the state of the server. You are telling, first of all, you are sending the information, how much money do I want to move or, or charge or receive or whatever it is. And then you give the, which account number, etc. So this is the information that you have to send to the server. And then the transaction occurs on the server. So which means the server state is modified. So let's talk about DNS a little more. So domains need to be registered with, with registrars such as, uh, you know, there are many, you know, I'm sure you have used GoDaddy or one and one or Network Solutions or some such registrar for a fee. Of course, um, domain name registration usually at least is not free. Although nowadays there are some free domain registrars as well. So domain owners decide which DNS host points to what IP address. What does that mean? That means which DNS name points to which IP address. Mm, I decide that www.spinspire.com points to such and such IP address, which is my production server. Or spinspire.com points to a certain server. So, here's an example, www.spinspire.com points to 107.155.95.125. That's a fact. Look it up. So, clients, on the other hand, for example, if you are 
trying to visit www.spinspy.com on your browser, you will not be hitting my own uh, DNS server, my own name server, because you probably have your own name server or DNS server provided by your internet service provider. And that internet service provider, uh, that DNS server, uh, somehow through a chain of events, ends up querying my DNS server for where is www.spinspy.com? What IP address does that point to? So these na name servers, they eventually query the domain name server, which is spinspy.com's name servers. Um, and then there can be some caching. There can be some delays in transferring the names to the IP addresses. Now, DNS system uses DNS records. So what are DNS records? These are the the name servers have records or entries, and the records are um, names pointing to IP addresses. That's the most common case. But then, of course, there, there are other versions of it, some variations. So CNAME records, or canonical names, these are, um, these are um, names pointing to names. But A records are names pointing to I IP addresses. So A records are a special type of record. C name records are another type of records. Uh, A records uh, translate names into IP address, the numbers, while C name records um, translate names into other names, which might in turn further point to other names. And But eventually the chain has to end in an A record because that's, that's needed so that you can finally figure out what IP address this C name or a chain of C names points to, eventually pointing to an A record, and A record gives you an IP address. Then there are other types of special records like TXT records. Um, so these TXT records, they, they are basically key value pairs. Keys are the names and then the values are some textual information. For example, public key of a website. So most domains use a combination of A records and CNAME records. So let's talk about um, default ports for various common protocols. SMTP uses port 25. HTTP defaults to port 80. HTTPS, which is the secure version of the encrypted version of HTTP, uses 443. POP uses 110. IMAP uses 143, and so on and so forth. So these uh, are some of the well-known protocols and their default port numbers. Um, SSH, which I did not include this in this list, uh, uses port number 22. But I think SSH is one of the most important protocols, especially for developers. Let's talk about URLs, or Universal Resource Locators. So URLs follow a certain pattern. They have a scheme, a host, path, query string, and a fragment. Let's, let's take an example here. So the scheme in our example is HTTPS. So it can be, it's usually a protocol, HTTP, HTTPS, but for example, there is no scheme for SM. SMTP. Instead, you use mail to scheme. So that's why uh, protocols and schemes are not exactly the same every time. Then you have the host name, which is basically a DNS name. So in our case here, it's spinspy.com. It could have been server1.spinspy.com or www.spinspy.com. Then there's a path. Path in our example is slash articles. So this points to an endpoint within the server so that the server determines what program on its end to run in response to your request. Query, or the query string, is basically a series of name value pairs. So in our example, it's page, the name, equal to one, the value. So key value pairs. Page is the key, one is the value. If you had multiple of these, you would separate them with ampersands. And finally, the fragment. Uh, 
keep in mind that fragment is not a part of the HTTP protocol. It is uh, an artifact of HTML. The fragment is uh, up to this point was the URL and then uh, the, if, as, as seen by the HTTP protocol. The fragment is basically a location and address within the response page. So uh, usually it will be a an anchor location but it can be any type of location. It's basically telling the browser that within this response locate where pound sign main content where main content uh, location is and it's up to the browser to decide how to find it what it means typically in the case of HTML uh, uh, pound sign main content uh, usually points to an anchor tag a tag with a certain ID in this case a tag with ID equal to main content All right, so now it's time to see the entire life cycle of loading a page in a browser. So when you type something into the address bar of a browser, what happens? So you enter a URL into the browser. The browser first looks up the TNS name to get the corresponding IP address. So when I typed spinspire.com into my browser, it trans it went to its own name server and asked for you know translation from name to IP, which in turn could have asked some other upstream server, and eventually the chain would end in spinspire.com's own name servers. Um, but in any case, it translates the name to an IP. Then it determines the port. Well, the port is determined usually from the protocol unless you specify the port with a colon port in, within the URL. Most of the time you don't. So since we are using HTTPS, it would be the port 4, 443. If it will, we are using HTTP, it would be port 40. Then the client, which is the browser, connects using TCP IP to that server's IP, which it figured out by looking up the DNS name and the port number, which it figures out from the protocol makes a TCP IP connection. The server hopefully accepts the connection if the server is not overloaded. Then the browser issues a GET request. It's literally sending text, remember? So it will send um, GET slash some path uh, and along with the query string and all that. And it of course sends a bunch of request headers. We have seen all these things here in this example when we went to the Chrome developer tools. The server then tries to process the request, which means it runs a program in response to the request coming in. The program could be something as simple as read a file and, and type and print the body or contents of the file to the response string. It could be that simple uh, or it could be something more complicated which involves a lot of processing. So it processes the request and produces a bunch of headers and the HTML response body. You can see those headers right here. These are the response body headers and then this is the response body. Okay and the HTML response contains references to assets such as CSS, JS, images, etc. You can see those right here. You see how uh, there is a link rel fav icon. And uh, let me expand this window a little bit. And uh, you can probably see that this server response has. There it is. These are the references to other media, um, other assets. Um, so there's a style sheet asset and there's a script asset, modernizer min.js and so on and so forth. So these, like I said, the response contains references to assets, uh, CSS files, JS files, images, whatnot. 
The browser then parses the HTML response and immediately issues more requests for these assets. Remember, uh, that is why we have so many requests being shown right here. The, each one of them is an asset that was referenced by the HTML that was produced in this, uh, for the first request. So remember, one page loading doesn't consist of one request. It is several requests, a whole bunch of them. So the browser shows the head part of the HTML art atomically. Now, what does that mean? That means, let me go here. This part, which is head from here to wherever it ends, right? Probably, yeah, up to this point. This is shown only after all of it is loaded. So that's why I said atomically. It waits for the entire head and all of its assets to be loaded. But the body, it shows progressively, which means after head comes the body. And body, it starts showing as soon as some content arrives. So this is the point at which you can start seeing something only after body starts loading. Then the browser builds a DOM tree or a document object model tree from the HTML. This is the data structure within the browser that it builds out of the HTML. So once all of the document is, uh, all of the HTML is received of the primary request, that's when it has finished loading uh, just the HTML, just the um, primary HTML, not the assets yet. That's when the document ready event is fired once the entire DOM tree is built, all of the, the initial HTML has been received. The assets might still be coming, but the initial HTML has been received and the DOM tree has been built. Then the browser starts integrating assets into the DOM tree as they arrive, which means if CSS arrives, it will integrate that into the tree, or if JavaScript arrives, it will run some JavaScript, etc. But by that time, document ready event is already issued. So this um, integrating assets into the DOM tree images, for example, that is done progressively as they are. Um, a JavaScript interpreter is created the first time any script is loaded. Okay. And then JavaScript code is executed as soon as the script starts loading. So as it is encountered, basically. Unless, of course, you have um, deferred tag, deferred attribute on the JavaScript, um, which is possible. We will talk about deferred some other time. So, document loaded event is fired once all of the assets are loaded, which means at this point, the entire HTML documents document along with all of its assets is fully loaded. And uh, at that point, the user interacts with the page, although the user can interact with the page even before document is fully loaded, remember that, because you can start scrolling, for example, you can click on another link that showed up, even though the document is still loaded. But in any case, user could be interacting with the page, and these various user interactions, they fire DOM events, like you hover on something, you click on something. Um, in these DOM events, uh, they, they they are met with the default reactions of the browser or they there can also be JavaScript code that runs in response uh, as event handlers. And then, for example, clicking a hyperlink or submitting a form will cause the current page to unload and a new page to load. And that means the whole cycle repeats. Now, once again, a new HTTP request will be issued. That request might give an HTML response, which will have references to other asset assets. Each of those assets will uh, cause their own HTTP request to be executed and so on and so forth. Of course, a new HTTP request and the, will, will be issued, but the cycle repeats, which is unloading of the page and loading of the new page happens unless you use Ajax. Now Ajax, <laughs> if you use Ajax, uh, then the current page stays loaded while JavaScript issues a new HTTP request 
in the background as opposed to unloading the current page it keeps the current page loaded issues an HTTP request in the background waits for the response asynchronously in fact doesn't wait for the response gives a callback function in JavaScript which will be invoked when the response comes all that uh, will be covered in a different session on Ajax at this point that's all we have to say so I hope you found this session useful uh, if you have any questions please uh, let me know through comments through emails through website contact forms uh, however you prefer thank you